Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to Podcastage. Today I'm back with a review of another podcasting console. The device that we're looking at is the Tascam MixCast 4 Podcast Station with built-in recorder USB audio interface. If you are interested in this device, it will cost you around $500. Like always, I'll throw some links in the description down below. Also, in the sake of full disclosure, I do need to let you know that Tascam sent me this device free of charge for the sake of making this review. And with all of that being said, for the majority of this video, I'm running the Rode NT1 directly into the MixCast 4. Gain is set at 22, 48 volts is on, and as far as the processing on the device, I just have the compressor as well as the noise suppressor engaged. 24-bit, 48 kilohertz, and I will not do any kind of post-processing, and I don't think I will have to do any kind of boosting in post, but check the lower third or the doobly-doo to see what I diddly did. And now let's go ahead and talk about what comes in the box. What a surprise you are going to get the Tascam MixCast 4. You will also get the required power cable, a very short USB-C to USB-C cable, and a little bit of documentation. Then as far as the build quality, I don't have any serious complaints about the device. The top of the device is going to be a piece of metal, while the sides and the bottom are made out of plastic. The dials are all pretty nicely attached. The faders feel really nice, but they do have a little bit of wobble to them. The soft touch buttons do have a little bit of clicky feedback to them. The XLR ports are nice and they have minimal movement to them. And in case it matters to you, this device is made in China. With all of that out of the way, now let's look at the specs. As far as the bit depth, it has 24 bit and a sample rate of 48 kilohertz. It has a gain range of 66.5 dB. That is not max gain, that is gain range. It has an EIN of negative 125 dBU, a 48 volts phantom power. And in case you're curious, here are all the other specs for this device. You can pause it and go from frame to frame to see if it has what you want. And as far as the headphone amps go, I found them to be extremely loud and more than capable of driving headphones like the HD 650s to a painful level. The majority of the time, I keep the headphone volume at around 1.5 or 15% below 9 o'clock. If I go louder than this, I find it painful to listen to, so it's got some juice to them if that's something that's important to you. I wanted to point that out. Very loud headphone amps in my experience. Now buckle up because we are going to walk through all the ins and outs and functionality of this device. The first thing you're going to see are eight physical faders, the first four being for the XLR combination jacks on the rear, the fifth being for the USB input, Next, we have the phone, which is going to be for a 3.5 millimeter TRRS. Then we have Bluetooth, which is obviously going to be for a Bluetooth connection. And lastly, we have the sound pad. So if I play a sound pad and bring this up, you can hear that coming through on the recording and bringing it back down. Then above each of the channels, you have a mute or solo button. The mute button always comes in handy. I will demonstrate this now. I will keep talking. Keep talking. Now I am and now I am unmuted and muting, 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 uh, 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 And then you'll find a solo button which will isolate the track that you've soloed so you can monitor it. Then we have a bunch of dials, the first one being a monitor out dial. This is going to control the level going out to a set of studio monitors. Then you have four headphone controls. This is going to control the volume going to headphone output one through four, which is quarter inch on the rear. Then you have a really big record or pause button, a stop button, and a mark button. While you're recording, if you want to add a marker, go ahead and hit mark, and you can see it said mark set one. Then you have the really large touch screen, which we will walk through a little bit later. And to wrap it up at the bottom, you have eight sound pads. I'll go ahead and bring this up and play some A. <laughs> Very cool, and you do have a sensor button as well, so if I wanted to swear, I could say, you mother and you couldn't hear me. All you could hear is the sensor button. Really quickly, on the front of the device, you have a 3.5 millimeter jack. 
This is a TRRS jack, so you can use a gaming headset and send in the microphone as well as get the audio out to your headphones. Then on the top of the device, you have this indicator light. When you are not recording, the light will be off. If I hit record, you will see that it goes red to let everybody in the room know that the device is recording. And then if I pause the recording, you can see that the light starts to blink red. And if I start recording again, it goes solid red. Just a nice indicator for everybody in the room. Then on the rear of the device, you will find a power button to turn on or off the device, the jack to connect power to the device. Then you have the four quarter inch headphone outputs. If we pull this open, you have a full size SD card slot. You have a set of quarter inch monitor outputs to run this to your studio monitors, a USB-C port to connect this to your computer or device, and a 3.5 millimeter line output. Then you'll find a stereo set of quarter inch line inputs, a 3.5 millimeter TRRS input to connect a phone, and a switch to select between the line in or the phone input. And finally, you have four XLR quarter inch combination jacks. Now, if we wanted to dive into any of the channels and adjust the processing, we would click on whichever channel we want to adjust. For this example, we'll be adjusting channel one, so I will click on channel one. The first thing that you have is this meter on the left hand side. It does have some scale to it and it also has this area that you ought to be shooting for. I'm not quite hitting it because I moved off the microphone after I set my gain. The second you have your gain setting. Then you have dynamic or condenser microphone. This will essentially turn on or off the 48 volts phantom power. I am using a condenser microphone, but it's a tube condenser, so I have it set to dynamic because I don't need to run phantom power to the microphone. Then you have front and rear. This will tell channel one if you want to use the XLR port on the rear or the 3.5 millimeter TRRS plug on the front of the mixer. And then you have the main reason you're probably diving into this menu and that is voice setting. When I click on this, you can see it is the processing. You have EQ, compressor on the second page. You have de noise suppressor, and ducking. Let me go ahead and turn those off and go back to the first page. I will turn off the compressor. And now let us turn on the tone and play around with this a bit. Right now you're hearing me with the tone setting or the EQ setting set off. When I turn it on, I have the deep setting turned on. It should add a bit of low end to my voice. If I switch over to mid, sounds a little bit honky, a little bit eh, 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 really comes across in the mids. If I turn on bright on this already <laughs> extremely bright microphone, maybe not the best fit. And then if you engage manual, you can click on the gear icon. You have two shelves. You have a low frequency and a high frequency. Right now, I have a negative 6 dB low shelf at 230 hertz. And then in the high frequency, I have 0 dB. But let's just go ahead and crank this up. We can get up to 12 dB of gain on each of these bands. That is the manual EQ. Now I've adjusted my gain, so I'm hitting the sweet spot on the meter. This is going to ensure that I am going into the plugins and the compressor settings exactly as they intended. So when I turn on compressor, this is the soft compressor settings. This is how the soft compressor sounds. Not doing too much, just a little bit of compression. Then when I switch over to the hard preset, you can really start to hear the higher volume portions of my speaking voice get pulled down and tamed, kind of attenuates the overall level of the recording really quickly, going from the soft compressor preset to the hard preset, you can hear that level get attenuated a bit. And lastly, we have the manual setting, and once I click on the gear icon, you can see these are my settings. Again, this is going to be based on the LA-2A because I love the LA-2A. Ratio of 3 to 1, 10 millisecond attack, 110 millisecond release. At least I think this is what the LA-2A... I set this up a while ago, but that is the presets and those are the functions that you have. Let me turn off the compressor and go to the next page. The first bit of processing here is a de and you do have a gear icon here. 
you can adjust the threshold or how loud your S's need to be before it starts attenuating them. And you have the ability to adjust the frequency that you are focusing on with your DSer. So you have those abilities there. That is the DSer plugin. And next we have the noise suppressor. And something to note here, this is where they have the high pass filter. So if you want to add a high pass filter, this is where you are going to find it. I don't like having high pass filters too high. I typically start around 50 to 60 hertz. That's where I'll keep it. As far as the noise gates concerned, I don't like attenuating too much. I don't like having a negative infinity noise gate because it sounds a bit too unnatural. I try to do negative 5, negative 10 dB somewhere in there because that will attenuate the noise floor, but it won't make it sound unnatural or like you're in a completely dead and silent environment. And the last thing that you have is ducking. This is going to attenuate all the other channels whenever you are speaking, if you are on microphone one. And in order to demonstrate this, I turned on with pad. That means whenever I speak, even the sound pads will be attenuated. So I'll go ahead and bring up the sound pads and play a long audio sample, like the drums. And then if I start talking, you can hear the drum sounds get attenuated just a little bit. I'll go ahead and play it again. And then when I stop talking, the drums become loud again. And here are the settings for the ducking feature, just in case you want to know what you're able to control. But these are the presets. Something else that I want to point out really quickly, if I go into any of the non-microphone channels like USB, cell phone, or Bluetooth, it also has that voice setting. It doesn't give you all the same processing capabilities, but it does give you a little bit of functionality in terms of a de-esser, noise suppressor, or just basic presets or enhancements for spoken word or if you're playing music. Then if I click on the hamburger menu, the very first option is another way to get to each of your channels and make adjustments. I'm not a big fan of this route because it's too many clicks. I like that they have updated the firmware to allow you to just click on the channel at the bottom and make adjustments there. Now I'm no longer recording on the task cam because while I'm recording, you could see I wasn't able to access these portions of the menu. The first one allows you to listen back to your recordings if you want to on the device. If we go back, jump to the next one, this allows you to adjust the sound pads on the device, change the colors, you can change the play method, all of that stuff, and you do have eight different banks of sound pads or sounds if you want to add them. Going back one more time, the next one is going to be your hardware settings. If we dive a little bit deeper, this allows you to turn on mix minus, auto mixer, feedback prevention, line level output, and solo mode is going to allow you to change that from P, P pre fader or post fader. Going back, multi tracking, this allows you to turn it on or off for the SD card. And if you want the multi track to bypass the processing that you're doing. Next, we have the USB delay button. This allows you to delay the audio going over USB to your computer by up to two seconds. This is going to be really helpful if you're doing a stream and you're having trouble getting your audio and video to sync. This will allow you to handle that right here in the device. And the last button here allows you to adjust the language, the date and time, factory reset, and it tells you the firmware you're running. Beneath those buttons, you do have the brightness control for the touchscreen display. So you can turn the brightness down or turn it back up depending on your desires. Then we have the advanced button. Let's go ahead and press that. And that is all that we have the ability to turn on or off the decibel meter. I will turn this off, go home. Now you see my meters do not have any decibels. If we go back in there, advanced, turn it back on, go to home. Now you can see all the meters do have decibel readings. Going back into the hamburger menu, we have one final option that is SD card settings. This shows you how much time you have left to record. It allows you to record to the SD, record stop confirmation, SD device mode. This will allow you to transfer files to your computer without having to pull the SD card out of the device and plug it into your computer. Really nice. And then you have quick erase and full erase. 
And that is everything that you're able to do on the device as of firmware 1.21-0137 on the 15th of June. There you go. That's the walkthrough. Now, like we always do, I'm running the Shure SM7B, which is an incredibly quiet microphone directly into the Mixcast 4. No inline preamp like a cloud lifter or a FET head. My level is set at 40, and on my computer, I am hitting around negative 18 to negative 12 dB, which is exactly where I want to record. I will be quiet so you can hear the noise floor at this gain level. And just in case you're a really quiet talker, now I am speaking softly, and I increased my gain to 100%, and this is the noise level that we're getting. I will be quiet so you can focus on just the noise floor. Now I'm going to connect a 150 ohm resistor to the microphone preamp and slowly increase the gain so we can hear what kind of noise is generated by this device's preamps. Now, just out of curiosity, I want to compare the preamps noise in the Mixcast 4 to those in the Rodecaster Pro 1. So in order to do that, I'm running the Shure SM7B through a microphone splitter, then running the microphone into both devices. I have level matched them as closely as I possibly can in the analog realm. On the Mixcast 4, I am at 40 on the microphone level. On the Rodecaster Pro, I am set to 47. The processing is turned off for both devices, and I am only capturing the single microphone preamp that I'm using, and now I'm going to connect a 150 ohm resistor and compare the noise floor to see how each of them perform. And now just to test the XLR quarter inch combination jacks, I'm running the Manly Reference Cardioid through the 73 EQ outboard preamp and then running quarter inch line input to channel 1's XLR quarter inch combination jack. If I dive into channel 1 settings, you can see that I have my level set at zero, which is what I would expect running a line level input into there. Then if we go to voice setting, we would be able to turn on the compressor and use an outboard preamp and then get compression using the Tascam. So there is a really quick example using the XLR combination jacks as a line level input for an outboard preamp. Then as far as latency, with your sample rate set at 48 kilohertz and an I.O. buffer of 64 samples, we have a 9 milliseconds round trip latency, or a 4.4 milliseconds output. Jumping to 128 samples, we have 11.6 milliseconds round trip, or 5.7 milliseconds output. And jumping up to 256 samples, we have 17 milliseconds round trip, or 8.4 milliseconds output. Now here is a really quick demonstration running my electric guitar directly into the Mixcast 4, which does not have a high z instrument input, and then comparing that to the high z input of the Universal Audio X8. This is to demonstrate why I don't recommend running DI instruments on the Mixcast 4.
All right, I think that the Mixcast 4 is a perfectly sufficient device that solves a lot of the issues that I had with the original Rodecaster Pro when that had initially come out. And first up, as far as pros, the automatic mix minus on the phone, USB and Bluetooth connection are really useful. I also like that it has the multi-track capabilities on SD card or over USB. Also, you have access to pretty granular control over the majority of the processing on the device. You get XLR combination jacks, which allow for microphone input or my favorite, line input because I like to run outboard gear whenever I feel like it. You also get multiple sound pad banks, which is incredibly useful if you have multiple shows. And while you're recording, you will be able to switch between all the sound pad banks with an upcoming firmware update. And finally, the headphone amps on this thing are incredibly powerful, more than capable of driving hard to drive headphones like the HD 650s to a painful level. So it's got the juice. The juice is loose. Can I say that? I don't think I can. <laughs> and then as far as cons, I did find the touchscreen to be a little bit unresponsive at times, which made it a little bit difficult to get into the really granular controls of some of the processing. I also found the EQ settings to be a little bit limited because you only have a high shelf and a low shelf filter, so you don't have much in terms of EQ capabilities. Additionally, when you're recording to the SD card, due to technical limitations, the files are split up at 35 minutes. I just don't like that because if you have to sync up the files and stitch them together in a piece of software that isn't Taskam's podcast editor, it can be quite difficult with the poly wave files. I would prefer that the recording wasn't split up into multiple files, but I understand the limitation. I just want to point it out. Also, currently in the Tascam podcast editor, it does have normalization export settings. Those normalization export settings do not work. I tried every single file format and I could not get any kind of normalization out of it. That would be a simple fix with a software update, so I'm sure we should expect that in the future. And the last con is more of an FYI. Make sure you're using a high enough speed USB cable and a high enough speed USB port and connecting the device directly to your computer. Otherwise, you may end up with audio that sounds like this, which was an absolute nightmare to troubleshoot. So we're testing out this device and I don't know what my voice sounds like. You're going to have to tell me if I sound anything like you know that I sound. And that is a really bad way to word it, but hey, it's going to work for us. That was Alan from Sound Speeds, and that is not how he sounds, but that's a playback audio issue that occurs after about 30 minutes. If you're connecting the device to your computer through a USB hub or a slow USB port or cable. So the FYI is don't do that and connect it directly to your computer with a higher speed USB cable and you won't run into that issue. Problem solved. <laughs> and to wrap up, would I recommend the Tascam Mixcast 4? Both yes and no. Like I mentioned, the Mixcast 4 resolved a lot of the issues that I had with the Rodecaster Pro 1 when this initially came out. The issue arises when I point out that so did Rode. To me, there's very little that differentiates the Rodecaster Pro 1 from the Mixcast 4. As far as the preamp noise, to me, it seems nearly identical. As far as the tone of the preamps, I did slightly prefer the Mixcast 4 for the SM7B. I just thought it sounded a little bit more natural. Also on the Mixcast 4, you're getting those XLR combination jacks. Those allow for line level inputs. So if you're somebody who runs outboard gear like an outboard preamp into a compressor, that's going to make the Mixcast 4 win out over the Rodecaster Pro 1 every single time. You can run that outboard pre, outboard compressor, and then use a de and a noise gate on the Mixcast 4. So in my experience and with my specific use case, I would be leaning towards the Mixcast 4 because it does allow for that line input. But if you're stuck between the Rodecaster Pro 1 and the Tascam Mixcast 4, I do think the Tascam is a slight improvement. If you already have the Rodecaster Pro 1, I don't see any need to switch between these. And if you get either of these, you're gonna get great sound out of it. It's just if you need that additional line input and if you want a slightly different sound of the pre's from the Tascam. 
But then we get to who I wouldn't recommend this thing for. If you're a musician, I don't think this is made for you. I think you'd be much better served with a proper audio interface. You can't even do DI instruments on this thing. This is not for you. Do not get this. Also, if you're a solo streamer or a solo podcaster, I don't think this is necessary because you'd be getting a lot of preamps and a lot of features that you ultimately wouldn't end up using. You could spend your money much more wisely on a device that's tailored for an individual, for one microphone or two microphones, and that's it. This is too much gear for what you're looking for. And the final reason why I might not recommend the Tascam Mixcast 4 is a little bit tentative, but based on everything promised by that new Rodecaster Pro 2, if, and it is a big if, the Rodecaster Pro 2 does everything that it promises and it functions flawlessly and is reliable, then I do think the Tascam Mixcast 4 and the Rodecaster Pro 1 are kind of obsolete, but if the Rodecaster 2 does fall short of expectations, doesn't deliver everything that it's promised, and it is unreliable, then I think the Mixcast 4 is a good fallback. And that is all that I've got for you today. I have to admit, I am thrilled to be done with this review because reviewing stuff like this takes easily 50 hours. Lucky me, now I have to start working on the Rodecaster Pro 2, which is likely going to take 70, 80, 100 hours. Anyway, let me know in the comments down below what you think of the Tascam Mixcast 4, the feature set, the price point. Do you think it's worth the money or do you think you could spend your money better elsewhere? If you did find this video fun, interesting, or helpful, go ahead and give me a thumbs up, hated it, big ol' thumbs down. Want more videos, subscribe, hit that logo and bell icon, all that kind of stuff. Discord podcasters.com slash discord talk microphones and stuff and what do i do next and if you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here you can do so by clicking that join button or going to patreon.com slash podcastage and joining at the five dollar tier or higher it really truly does help me continue to bring you these videos when they take me 50 freaking hours to do them go darn it Happy to be done with it. I will talk to you all later. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. I love you. Bye-bye. Whoa. Whoa. Boop. Hated it. Big old thumbs down. Let me swallow. That came out wrong.